Um, I used to do a bunch of things. So I did hair in college. I did, you know, I sold clothes. I actually ran a first venture called Vanilla Cristal, where I was selling ties for men. Nice. Has anyone ever won my ties? I know some people in the building have. <laughs> um, and I was doing that, and every single year I came to the UIU convention, I actually was vending outside. And I, I was vending every year. Um, and I got to meet a lot of you guys, you know, the interesting part of it was that I would see people wearing my ties at the band because I would be like, <laughs> that's me, you know, and that gave me excitement and there's some excitement that comes from actually working your purpose, doing something and having an idea and bringing it to fruition, right? And, you know, based on that, I said, well, I love what I'm doing, but I really want to do something that has a huge social impact and could benefit a bunch of people's lives and make them better and whatever, right? And the reason why I started a healthcare company is because while I was in college, I had a traumatic health experience that actually almost cost me my life. So I was Googling my symptoms um, and I had pain in my abdominal region. And then a few days after self-medicating, I felt really bad pain, I actually passed out I was rushed to the hospital by my roommate for emergency surgery on a very different uh, condition from what I was Googling. So Dr. Google, friends, is not your friend, okay? <laughs> and post that experience, I started to develop this idea around how do we connect people, especially young women, young women like us who, growing up conservative, never really talked about women's health, their bodies, or anything like that, to find a place where they could safely and securely connect with doctors, right? That's essentially what I built. And I reached out to a company in India, and I said, hey, I want to build this thing, it's an MVP, right? Simple product that would answer a simple question and see how it goes, right? So that's exactly how I started. And when I did this, you know, I started to develop a team, and I said, well, my background is not in medicine, and I'm not a developer, but I need people around me who can lead me to a place where I can develop this thing and really bring it to life, right? And I reached out to a friend and I said, hey, I know you went to medical school. Do you have someone who will be interested in what I'm working on who can work with me? And she said, well, I have this really great friend I went to medical school with, she's awesome, and she gets to know her, you guys move on. And we connected and this doctor became my co-founder and my chief medical officer of my company today, right? Because she fell in love with me, I mean, hey. <laughs> And we started developing this product, and you know, it, it essentially, what happened was we started putting it in people's hands, right? It's all about you have an idea, right? And you just make it happen, do it. Because a lot of times people tell me, hey, just so I have this idea and I'm afraid people will steal my idea. Yeah, no one can actually steal your idea and execute on it the way you can. Talk about it. That's a fact. Talk about, Talk about it. it. Look to the person next to you and really talk to them about it. I had a conversation with someone in the hallway about what they did, and one thing I realized was they never asked me what I did. And I said, why are people having these conversations? You have to talk about things, talk to people to get to the destination that you need to be, right? And that was a missed opportunity, but I hope I see her during this convention so we can talk. <laughs> but, you know, in my mind, everywhere I go, I've always needed someone else's support and help to get there. Because I am not an expert in the field that I'm in, but I hire doctors today, I hire nurses, and I hire a bunch of engineers, okay? All right, you must have done. So, in, in, in all of it, right, you know, like I said, build this product, um, I started, you know, thinking through how do I actually get out there, didn't have any money, wanted to figure out how to, you know, really run this, and then I started to speak. So I did a bunch of speaking and a lot of pitch competitions, and I won almost $500,000 in talking alone. And it was all about getting on stage and describing my idea and convincing everyone that I was the best person to do it. Reflecting back on who am I? Onye Kampu, Alan Madi. It's the very first thing to think in your mind, remember that you are somebody, someone is gonna listen to you, and grasp everything that you, in your essence, are providing and make that chance to make an investment in you, right? And then post that, this is free money, y'all. $5,000 in free money that I had to build a product. 
And then shortly after, I started, you know, going to talk to investors about my idea and everything. And as of today, within the past six months, your girl over here has raised close to four million dollars. And that has been one of the first, I think it's right now we're about 50 black women in the US who have raised over a million dollars in venture capital. This is the girl who was banging outside last time, y'all. So a lot of space is there. And when I, you know, think about my journey and everything, just in summer, I know we're kind of cutting close to time, pizza. We're cutting close to time. I want you to take one thing with you, right? Remember that you are somebody. You have something to say. You have some essence within you. And if you haven't quite found it, that's okay. You know, one day you will, but talk to people about it. Make sure that every time you walk into a room, you are what? Remembered. Make sure when you walk into a room that someone in there is someone that you can connect with. Now they say we're all here, we're about networking and everything else. Talk to the person next to you that you did not come here with and ask them how you can be of help to them. One thing I always say is, whenever I have a conversation with someone, I always have an ask and I always have a give. Meaning, what do you need? How can I help you? And here's what I'm doing and here's how you can help me. We're all family up and I believe if we continue to work as family and we continue to thrive and excel in everything that we do, Guys, the sky is our limit, okay? All right, well, thank you very much for having me. Love you guys. The Forma of Hoyeri's writing and producing work includes award-winning and critically acclaimed independent films. In 2008, there was a visible lack of web series of color being produced, so she created Life, Love, and Hollywood. This was followed by the HBO award-winning short, Good Intentions. In 2020, Alphonary sparked early Emmy buzz surrounding her brilliantly written episodes on HBO's Lovecraft Country, which was one of the most talked about new series on TV. Using her exquisite writing style, she also contributed to season four of FX's Snowfall. Iguama is currently developing multiple projects that will revolutionize and propel diversity for women of color. Iguama Ahonuri is a face of true evil excellence. I mean, you are not. Indie evil, you are not. You are you, you are not. Um, first, I just want to give a quick shout out to UIU for asking me to be a part of this. This is truly an honor, and I'm very happy to be here. So, last month, I spent my birthday in Colombia, and I was riding on this ATV through the jungle, and I was looking out at this vast valley of beautiful mountains and these crystal clear rivers, and I was actually thinking about what was I going to say to you guys when I got here. And I was wondering, what is evil excellence to me, and what does that mean, and all this stuff, and something just hit me at that moment, because I realized that I was living out the life that I had always envisioned. Woo! I had always dreamed about having success in Hollywood, I always dreamed about speaking at a convention, I always dreamed about traveling the world with freedom and financial security, and here I was, in nature, actually doing it. Now, me getting to this point in my life was 13 years in the making. And I honestly have to give my success and my perseverance to my ego culture and my bloodline. So today we're talking about ego excellence, and to me, ego excellence has always been our resilience. From the previous generation, like my parents who survived the Biafra War, to this generation where we just seem to dominate in every field that we choose. So, you know, um, I just want to talk briefly about my journey and how I got here. So growing up, I was always very inclined to creating and writing, and so I always had this dream of making it big in Hollywood. So I moved to LA with this Hollywood dream and no money, 
but his really, really strong drive of being successful. And if anybody is familiar with LA, it is a beautiful city, but it is not kind. It will chew you up and spit you out and look good doing it. So in order for me to really supplement my um, income and to really push for my dreams, I became a substitute teacher. <laughs> and dealing with other people's kids is not for the faint of heart. I cannot suggest it, so <laughs> do something else. So during this time as an unknown artist, I just really work on perfecting my craft and my writing technique and doing anything I could to really jumpstart my career. I wrote short films, I did web series, I won awards for my short film, but at that time, I was a bit impatient with where I was going in my career. I wanted more traction. And so like all journeys, we all experience moments of darkness. And my moments of darkness really consisted of a deep depression. Just because I was so obsessed with wanting to be successful and wanting to make a difference in my family being first generation. So during that time of this darkness, I was just finding myself in dead in relationships, dead in um, friendships, things that just made me feel broken and alone, and just really made me question my own self-worth. So at that time, when things just got so low and so debilitating, I just knew I had to make a drastic change. So the first change I made was to my mindset. I knew by changing my perspective and my views on the world that things around me would begin to change. So I got to work on just the self-doubt and all the growth that had built up over the years. My second act of change <laughs> was to quit my substitute teaching job. Now by this time, I had been teaching nine years, and I got really stuck in just the security of the job, the health benefits, the summers, and the holidays off. But every day that I went to that job and dealing with those badass kids, <laughs> <laughs> just realizing that I was not looking forward in my career, I knew I had to make a drastic change. So I made the decision just to quit my job with no security net, no other job prospects, nothing. So when I decided to quit that job, I made a really deep vow to myself that no matter what, I was not going back to teaching. I didn't care how broke I was, I didn't care if nothing ever worked out. I was done with that chapter in my life. So for the next 16 months, I really, really struggled. I had unemployment benefits that eventually ran out. I had no form of income. I had no support, essentially, just to keep my, you know, my head above water. But at that time, I also really was cultivating a deeper faith in myself and in God. And I also knew that the more I just paid attention to just having this self-reliance, that things will work out. And little by little, things started to shift. The first thing that happened that really changed was the people in my life started to disappear. And the people were being replaced by people who were just much more loving and supporting and who really just were there for me, who rooted for me. The second thing that changed was that I got a talent manager who actually really believed in my craft and my gifts and actually saw a bigger vision for myself than I did. And then the third thing, which is my favorite, uh, <laughs> Money just started to come to me in unexpected ways. Now, by this time, I had no employment benefits. I was just struggling. And so the neighborhood that I lived in, I just want to tell a quick story. The neighborhood that I lived in, in Los Angeles, we filmed a lot of TV shows on my blog. Like Insecure has shot on my blog, big commercials, big movies, right? And so a new production company came in, and out of the blue, they offered to pay me a thousand dollars just to use my parking space. Oh. Now, in all the years I have lived on this street and all the family that has done, I have never been paid. And the crazy thing about it was my rent was due in two days. Oh. And then hey. so, <laughs> it was the only I had to pay So when that happened, I was just reminded that God works through people oh, yeah. and circumstances. And I started to rebuild my confidence and my courage and understanding like things are starting to shift and change. And they did. <laughs> so the next thing that happened with the help of my manager, 
I landed my big break in the industry where I was hired on HBO's Lovecraft Country. And, <laughs> and although this was a really good opportunity for me, I started actually at the very bottom of the writing staff. I started off as a writer assistant. And if anybody is not familiar with how TV works, the writing room basically just consists of a bunch of writers who get together and we talk about the show, the story, the direction of the season. And so my job <laughs> was to be a fly on the wall and to take down the notes. And I was horrible at it because I do not know how to type. So <laughs> it was a very challenging time for me and I almost lost my job a few times, but I just really kept my head down and stayed focused on the job I had. So for the next six months, I was working about 80 hours a week. I was working to about 3 a.m. Monday through Friday, just transcribing about six hours worth of notes every day. So eventually, my job, my boss took notice of my hard work, and she offered me to write an episode. Now, just for context, the writer assistant does not usually get a chance to write an episode on the first year show. Plus, the fact that this was so high profile that J.J. Abrams and Jordan Peele producing, this is not typical. So when I was given this opportunity, I knew what it, what it meant and what it could mean for me, but I still had some doubts that were creeping up. I thought maybe I was an imposter, maybe I'm not ready for this, because the show was just so well crafted. But I put those thoughts aside and I just put my head down and I just got to work. So my episode was written very impressively. <laughs> <laughs> Directing my episode. Wow. wow! So this show really changed the trajectory of my career and it really put me in a position to where I can pick and choose the kind of projects that I want to do now. And as I move towards this next phase in my career, the projects and stories I want to tell are evil stories. I want to tell our stories. I really do. I really do believe that we have a rich culture and that we as a people should be celebrated by the world and that we do have a place in cinema. So just me being here in front of you is also just another full circle moment for me because I'm speaking to my people and I'm speaking about resilience and I'm speaking about who we are and the things that we can do in this world. So I just want to say to all the artists who are here that it is our duty to take control of our narrative, of our stories, because if we do not, we leave the door open for other people to write our history. Mm, that's good. So, as I wrap it up, and thank you, Kinsley, <laughs> I just want to just leave you guys with something that really stuck with me over this incredible journey. And that is that you are in control of your life. If you have a deep faith in yourself and in God, and you have a very clear vision of what it is that you want to achieve, you will do it. And just by tapping into your inner resources and the power that you innately possess, it will definitely guide you towards your destiny. Thank you so much. Emmanuel Achong is a New York Times best-selling author and the host producer of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. His groundbreaking online series to drive meaningful dialogue around racial insensitivity and ignorance launched in 2020 with more than 80 million views today. Emmanuel is a 2021 sports editor, Fox Sports analyst, and television personality. He's a former NFL linebacker and has a master's degree in sports psychology from the University of Texas. He partnered with Oprah to write a new book titled Illogical, Saying Yes to a Life of Elements, which will be out soon. Emmanuel Action is a face of true evil excellence. Ani Mwenem Madu, Indi Evo Mwenem Madu, UIU Mwenem Madu. Whoever found those 
those embarrassing pictures of like, I will find you. I think it was your sister. I will be. <laughs> um, man, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I haven't spoken in person in about a year now. I'm used to talking over Zoom. So, although I often am comfortable in conversations with a black man, I'm very uncomfortable right now. <laughs> um, I thought about how do I want to start? How in the world do I want to start? I can talk all about me and random success, but that's not cool. I'd rather tell you all how to be more successful than I. Um, your calling will call you. Pick it up. People always ask me, Amanda, what? Uh, how can I find my calling? How can I find my calling? Your calling will call you. Pick it up. Uh, it was about a year ago, it was June. I, after the murder of George Floyd, I was like, you know what, I have to do something. I can no longer sit here and watch. Um, I no longer sit here and watch black people die at the hands of white people. So I said, I gotta do something, I gotta do something, I gotta do something. Um, I had a lot of people on my team, assistants, publicists, all that. And when somebody on your team doesn't get the job done, you know what you end up saying? You say, you know what, I'm gonna do it myself. I'm gonna do it myself. And I was like, you know what, police officers, y'all might get the job done. Civil rights activists, y'all aren't getting the job done. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna do it myself. Um, I record the first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, and it was actually against the advice of my team. I call my team, I call my, my book agent. I say, hey, I have this idea. At first, it was gonna be called Questions White People Have. Terrible title. <laughs> At first, it was going to be called Questions White People Have. Why? White people, they have questions. Um, but then, my friend calls me, and she was white. And she was like, hey, you know it's more than just white people that have these questions. It's, it's, it's all types of people. So I, she's like, how do you feel about uncomfortable conversations? I was like, that's just so boring. So I'm walking through my house. I'm walking through my house. I just finished the bike ride. I'm walking through my house. I'm walking through my house. I walk past the mirror. You're a black man. Uncomfortable conversations with a black man. So I recorded the first video, and four days later I got a call for a no-caller ID number. I'm sitting on my dining room table in Austin, Texas, eating Cheerios. I do eat Cheerios, I don't I'm sitting on my dining room table in Austin, Texas, I get a call, I pick up. Acho McConaughey speaking. I want to have a conversation. McConaughey? Like Matthew um, he's like, yeah, man, I want to have a conversation. I was like, okay, um, let's do episode two in four days. True story. I did episode one and it got 25 million views in five days. You can't follow that up. I didn't want to be Soldier Boy in one hit wonder. So I was like, here's what I will do. True story. Episode two, I was like, I'm going to go on Instagram live. Because you can't follow up 25 million views in five days. Keep in mind, people knew me, but they didn't really know me, right? And so, I, like, I should have got 25 million views. All got And so, episode two, I was going to do an Instagram live. I hit up my dog, Toby. Y'all know Toby. Um, I hit up Toby's videographer. I said, hey, bro, I'm going to fly you from Houston to Austin to go on Instagram live. I was going to fly. I was going to drive no need to fly, I'm using Austin. So, I, I drive him from Houston to Austin, and he gets there, but McConaughey, I, when I tell McConaughey, let's do it in four days, he says, let's do it tomorrow. McConaughey wants to do it tomorrow, we do it tomorrow. True story, um, the studio is painted blue. Problem, if y'all haven't seen a comfortable conversation with a black man, it's in an all white studio. Studio is painted blue, I gotta do it white. Uh, we end up finding a white just sheet of paper and roll it behind us and we cheat the camera so it looks like we're in an all white space. We are not. After McConaughey and I recorded the next episode, I get a call three days later. No call right now. Uh, I pick it up. Hi Emmanuel, Oprah speaking. <laughs> You have time to FaceTime later today. Do I have time? Hello, Oprah wants to FaceTime. Do the calendar, please. Um, so I, I, I hop on FaceTime with Oprah. She's sitting in her kitchen, just chilling. I think she was wearing a bonnet. Oprah wears bonnets too. Um, and she's chilling, and all she asked me was this. She said, What? 
I gotta make this work for <laughs> All she asked me was this. She said, what is your intention? That's all she said. She said, what is your intention? I said, well, Oprah, my intention is to change the world. I truly believe that I can. Um, she said, I love that. I told her I plan on writing a book. She said, books? I love books. <laughs> um, so we partnered together to write a comfortable conversation with a black man. Ended up being a New York Times bestseller. A comfortable conversation with a black boy. I'll be honest, my last year has been a whirlwind, so I really don't think about the things that I've accomplished, but glory to God, because I'm honestly very basic. Uh, God just be showing out. It's crazy. Um, anyway, okay, enough about me. Let me get to, I think, the most important part for you all, uh, because my goal is just to see everybody be the best version of themselves. And there's a ton of world changes in here. We're evil, we're excellent, we're resourceful, we're resilient, we're confident. So pivoting, I assume I probably have six minutes, 46 seconds, how about the time? Nine? Beautiful. Um, um, okay, let me say this. Everybody is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it too will live its whole life believing it's stupid. Everybody's a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it too will live its whole life believing it is stupid. Now, why in the world am I saying an Albert Einstein quote? Well, one, because it makes me sound smart. <laughs> um, but two, and more importantly, because everybody in here is a genius. I'll leave that. I think every single individual in here is a genius. The question then becomes, what are you genius at? Because you're all, everybody sitting here is a genius. But what are you genius at? That is the secret. Um, I somehow, some way, am a gifted communicator. I don't know how I'm a gifted communicator, but I just ended up being one. My dad's a speaker, he's a pastor. So I sat through way too many Sunday services, like you all. You know, we all grew up the same. I sat through way too many Sunday services, and I just listened to my dad preach over and over and over and over. And I taught that, because more is caught than is taught. And so I realized that my genius is in communication. Some people's genius is expressed through their love. Some people's genius is expressed through their sport. Some people's genius is expressed through their servanthood. My genius is expressed through communication. So the kicker is this then. If you're a genius, you gotta find your genius. After I did the first, uh, after me and Oprah, after Oprah calls me, she calls me again and she's like, hey, I want to bring you on the Oprah conversation. Oprah conversations on Apple TV. Oprah conversations, that uncomfortable conversation. So we did a hybrid episode. Um, I hadn't met her in person and we had only talked on FaceTime. So our hybrid episode was daunting. It's me, it's Oprah. It is 10 people on iPad cameras and Oprah on a huge screen like this. I'm looking at Oprah, Oprah's looking at me, and 10 iPad cameras. The 10 individuals, a person would just pop up on camera and ask me a question. I was supposed to answer it with Oprah watching. Another individual would pop up and ask me a question. I was supposed to answer it with Oprah watching. And so I sit there and for two hours straight, I just get peppered with questions. I'm not that true. I told you I'm basic. God just be showing up. So I'm getting peppered with questions and I'm answering them and I'm answering them and I'm answering them. At the end of the conversation, uh, Oprah calls me. I missed her call, unfortunately. Uh, she calls me again. I missed it again. Her, her, her assistant runs into the room. Hey, great job. More importantly, Oprah's calling me. Oh, right. I call Oprah back. I call Oprah back. <laughs> um, so I call Oprah back and she said this, she said this, she said this, and everything. You have the thing, my friend, you have the thing. And coming from someone who had the thing and has the thing, you, my friend, you have the thing. I was like, okay, so what is the thing? Right, and Oprah tells you, you got the thing. So I got to tell me what the thing is, because I don't have the thing, and I know what the thing is. If I got the thing, I didn't know what the thing is, so I used it. So I said, so what is the thing? And she said, you have the ability to communicate with people harshly, but them still appreciate you while you're doing it by the way you package it. Okay. So, I'm here to tell you, you have the thing, my friend. You have the thing. 
And coming from someone who has a thing, <laughs> you, my friends, you have a thing. So you just got to figure out first, what is your thing? Your thing is, what are you predisposed to be good at? Like, what do you have a natural gravitation towards, a natural gravitation for, whether it's via your lineage, whether it's via your parents, whether it's just via your life, what do you have a natural gravitation for? Secondly, after you have the thing and you realize you have it, use the thing. Um, before a couple of conversations with a black man, I created that video. I was always creating videos, random videos, top five favorite Disney songs ever. I think You'll Be In My Heart was number one. Um, top five favorite, I was creating random videos. But then after the murder of George Floyd, that's when I said, you know what, it's time to create a more meaningful video. I didn't know it would pop off. It just so happened to pop off. And so um, all of that happened. That's when you find out you have the thing, you have to use the thing. But what you cannot forego is this. You have to develop the thing. So many people, and honestly, I don't even, every time I speak, I don't want to speak for me anymore. Um, it's a very weird place to be in, in my life. It's a very weird place. I don't talk about it very often. Uh, because everything just happened so fast. And I'm very undeserving of it all. And I'm not going to get emotional because my siblings are here. Um, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm very undeserving of it all. So I don't really I don't really care to succeed. I really want to see everybody else succeed. So develop the thing. Um, one of my favorite stories, biblical stories, uh, David and Goliath. So I know the story of David and Goliath because they talk about it far too often in sports. Um, the story of David and Goliath. When everybody else ran from Goliath, it says that David drew near to the Philistine and met him at the battle line. See, there's going to be a battle line that y'all are going to have to meet your Goliath at. Right? And when, when everybody is like, oh my God, this giant, run! David drew near and met him at the battle line. So then the question is, what is your battle line? Fear? Finances, fear of losing friendships, but don't run from your battle line, run to and meet your Goliath, whatever your specific Goliath is, at the battle line. But keep this in mind. Everybody was scared of Goliath. But David, who was it? Why wasn't he? Well, it led me to think of this. Don't be afraid of other people's fears. Because other people are afraid to go from a Thai industry to a medical professional industry. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would you do that? Well, selling Thai has got to do with the human body. Other people are scared of success. They're scared of being great. They're scared of achieving. But just by nature of us being evil, we don't have that fear. And if we do, just know you can overcome it like those who came before you did. Do not be afraid of other people's failures. I entered the room to do uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I did not know it would change my life. And also, aside, I paid for the studio. I paid for the wedding videographer. I paid for everything. Just for the sake of like, hey, see if you can change the world. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to So, as I'm opening the door with my right hand, my phone vibrates with my left hand. I got a text. Asha, I don't like this idea you're doing uncomfortable conversations with a black man. I, I respond, well, I just have to go the way God leads. More importantly, remember y'all, let me preface with this. The first episode of Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man is me sitting in a chair by myself, talking to a camera by myself. It's uncomfortable conversations with a black man. Not uncomfortable monologue with a black man. So why am I talking about myself? Because I got stood up at the last moment. I was never actually supposed to do it by myself. I don't tell this story often, but I was actually supposed to do it with a dear white friend of mine. She drove from Dallas, Texas to Austin, Texas, three hour drive, I don't know, at Interstate 35. We rehearsed the whole day in front of her mom, in front of her sister, on FaceTime, all that. Um, she calls me the next morning, tears in her eyes. 
I don't want to do what I can. It's not right. They don't want to see you. They don't want to see you. They don't want to see me. They want to see you. I can't do it. I'm like, hey, brother. <laughs> we practice this together. What do you mean? It's not right. It's not right. I don't want to see this. Y'all. I looked at her. I said, don't worry. I'll do it myself. Because sometimes in life, you just got to do it yourself. So, as I, um, as I draw to an end, I will kind of conclude like this. Honestly, I make things up on the fly. I don't really prepare for any speech because I don't want to give y'all anything that I got to practice. I'd rather just give y'all something that comes off the top of the dome. I say, no, don't worry, I'll do it myself. I go, I do it myself, um, and the rest becomes history. I think the last thing I'll close with, and I'm really just stalling because God gives it to me, because I don't really know what I'm going to say next. Um, that's usually how I speak. I speak not knowing what I'm going to say next. Um, the last thing I'll close with, when you finally have not been afraid of other people's fears, and you do go on to run to the battle line, and your calling calls you, and you pick it up, make sure you take people with you. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like, because, just make sure you take people with you. I think that's my, my, my biggest thing. I, um, I'll, I'll end with this, and I don't know if I'll be able to say it right. Um, by the way, I'm giving y'all a prelude of my book with Oprah. Still go buy the book. I'm not just giving y'all like a little 15 minute version. I'm fine with this. I was laying in bed when I was in the NFL, 2014, and I, I kept hearing this phrase in my head over and over and over and over. I could not shake it over and over and over. I couldn't shake it. So I did what most of us do. I picked up my phone. I picked up my phone and I typed in my notes section where I heard it. And it simply said this. My desire is to inspire those to go higher, past the required, so those they admire can also admire whom they inspired before they expire. I'll say it one more time. And I swear, if I see anybody quote this and outside of the watch, I will also My desire is to inspire. Those to go higher, past the required, so those they admire can also admire whom they inspired before they expire. My desire is just to see everybody be great. Go on. Y'all have fun? Yes. Yes. Okay. So one thing I, you know, before I appreciate the speaker, yes. one thing I learned, I think is a nice way to pivot from our Ayinwari Madam. I think let's switch it up a little bit. Let's say, Abu Madam. Abu Madam. So that's I'm excellent, but we're excellent. You know what we're all excellent at today, right now? We ended on time. <laughs> We should go out. Let's stay. We have a great session coming up immediately after Ego Gaate. Amen. Building generational wealth through the stock market and real estate. So, as we close, I want to call up the awesome speakers Crystal, Duhoma, and Nana. Just to be honest. Thank you everyone and a round of applause for the speaker.